sit up straight. Okay, you're now on tape. Hello, welcome everybody. This is going to be testing right now. So I won't say the things I'm going to be saying later. But I will say welcome all of you. It is the first night of a pink moon. Which isn't really pink, it's just very, very large. So why do they call it pink? Because they do. That's the language problem in the world. Good. Sweetie, can you hear her clearly? Hey, Joe. Hey, babe, we're testing. You ready to test? Hi, Eileen. Is, are they coming in clearly? Speak, Mom. Oh, ask if they're posted. Right, on? Yeah, we're on. Um, Did you post last side out? And Wonderful. Eileen says you sound great. Wonderful. Perfect. So we start in three minutes. Three minutes of testing. Beautiful. Okay, love you, Joe. Love you, babe. See you on tape. Bye. Bye. Love Hi, you. Eileen. Eileen Cutler says it sounds great. Wonderful. Greg Romer is watching. Eileen says, good job, Joni. Yay! <laughs> I'm a hell of a good film crew. She is amazing, and I do have to tell you, she's an amazing cook. I am multi-talented. I yeah. feed my mother and I tape her. Joe says you sound perfect and you look beautiful. Great. <laughs> you know, I went to um, Margaret Mead many, many years ago, somebody I loved. She's a historian, and she was speaking about men, and she said, when women cook, they're cooks. When a man cooks, he's a chef. Well, Joni's a woman, but she's a chef. A chef. A chef. So Joe is on, Joe Tripp, Eileen Cutler, <coughs> Greg Romer. Hi, all of you. And he says, you sound perfect and you look beautiful. And is I'm on also. Is admiring her new haircut? Okay, the haircut is a huge success on the first day. But then it's two days since I had it cut. And it's two windy days. And now it does not look the way I wanted to. But you know what? I don't care. It's at least they didn't recognize me the when they went to get a haircut because I had my pandemonium haircut. And it was- Pandemonium? Pandemonium. <laughs> <laughs> pandemonium is what it, it is. It was a pandemonium. Somebody Ken, say something. Kenny says, you and I rock. And Joe Tripp says, looks good. We do, we do. <laughs> and Eileen loves the song. Now, I have a rock. problem. Brendan Faye is going to have a birthday, or just had a birthday, and I wanted to wish him something, but I don't want to use social media. And I don't have his private number. So, Brendan Fay, happy birthday, darling. You're one of my favorite people. Okay, you start in less than a minute. Less than a minute. One, one thousand, two, one thousand, three, one thousand. Jeffrey now I'll Kishman just... is watching. Start. Welcome, everybody. Welcome. Let me begin right away. On the wall, thank you, Jesse, for putting it on. And if I do not pronounce it right, it's because I've been away from Panama for a long time, and it's a Spanish word, Luceda. Okay? I am now connected with Johnny Santano and with Willie Milan. And I love the connection because it deals with, in a sense, Panama for me, because I was never in Puerto Rico, but I do know how their music influenced the whole world. I come from Europe and was introduced to Spanish music when I came to Panama, and I love the beat. So enjoy those two songs.
that are those two videos that are there because they bring a culture which they brought into the Lower East Side for me through them but which I really met in Panama and it was such a wonderful thing so enjoy it and then the second video that they sent me the first one is about the hard work that immigrants do because Johnny and Willie and I have the same aim to have people be friends with each other and the amazing thing is at the beginning on the Lower East Side everybody was an immigrant and they helped each other let me ask you now that the Lower East Side is filled with gorgeous glass and expensive stores is it impossible to help each other because of that does does belonging make people less friendly because when all of us didn't belong because I came here as a refugee as well and did not belong if not for being somebody who loved drawing I don't know if I would have been accepted as so easily because I couldn't speak English and I couldn't speak Spanish and the immigrants who come here have their own language problems so let me switch over and tell you that I would like stories from you of what it was like when you or your parents or your grandparents first came to America it doesn't matter if it's Kansas it still means you're not accepted so let me tell you Janine Schultz and Fran Rosenberg and Julie Williams and Hernan Poza and Marilu Vilgre de Rodriguez and Ed Weedman are all on watching you. Okay, when I speak about the tree, I'm going to mention you guys, you people. I'm not going to say guys, it's an easy word, but that means only men, and we're all the mixtures. And Linda told me to watch out for that word. But it's too easy to use. Okay? Okay. Let me go back now to what I wrote down that I would now begin to speak. So what Kenny is saying is, can people share thoughts about this during this episode? And I would love it. Read what they write. I can read what they write. Oh, I would love it. Meaning the family experience as immigrants. I would love it. So this would be people sharing family experience as immigrants and they'd write it and I would be able to read it. More than anything, I would like it to be conversation. What I miss so much during the pandemic is conversation. What I also miss is texting has replaced speaking. When you say two words, but they should say a hundred. I would like to make room for a hundred. And if you send them to me, we will read them out loud. I would like this to replace texting. Am so I saying? People should write to you now while you're speaking, right? With a brief I, I'd description love it. of their family. Whichever way, otherwise you, wait, otherwise you wait till next week. And Johnny Santana sends his love. Johnny, thank you for your music. Okay? Okay, let me go to the Adler painting, because I have a lot to tell you about that. Again, my Lower East Side. I was painting on the Lower East Side, and a lady spoke to me and looked at me painting and began to ask me questions. And little did I know 
that it would become a lifelong friendship and we still correspond. And Yvonne, I wish I would have known you earlier because you would have been in that painting with the Adlers. I've got all the Adlers in there. What I do with paintings, whoever is nearby and says, could I be in the painting? I put them in. Years later, when Eric went with me and I began to paint in the Lower East Side, whenever people asked, could I be in the painting? He said, yes, if you give her a story of how you belonged here. And it changed everything. I now have stories of the people and I would like that with you because the stories matter. They'll replace the coldness of not knowing each other. So you're welcoming people giving you stories while you're talking, right? Completely. About their immigration experience. Completely, completely, completely. Because I intend to live very long. And if you don't get into the one from today, maybe you have to wait a week, actually. You're waiting for every single painting because I'm only on number 24 and I have 92 to go. And I'm beginning work on another one. So we'll be friends for a long, long time. Let me tell you more about the Adlers. In the story, you can see who is where. So I don't have to tell you that. And this is posted on your wall, right? It's posted on the wall. Thank you, Jesse. It's posted on my wall. Okay, I want to tell you more about the Adlers because the Adlers are givers. And Mike, who is, you know, in front of the, of the doorway, he's the tall skinny guy. Oh, they have it posted so okay. they can tell, they can I'll tell. I'll show them briefly. Okay. He's in the doorway. And we were very close friends at that time. And Eric and Mike became very close. And Elaine and I, we were like the sisters we never had. And I knew their kids because I painted them. I get to know everybody in my paintings. And Mike one day, Mike was very athletic, and the way he explained it to us, one day he was swimming, he went into the water, and he couldn't move, he didn't know how to swim. And he couldn't speak. And they went to a doctor, and most doctors had no idea what it was. It turned out to be something called aphasia which very few doctors knew about. So Mike and Elaine traveled everywhere until they could find a doctor who understood what it was. Aphasia is a loss of memory of certain things, things which had always been part of their lives. And when Mike was healed, they formed a place, and I wrote it down because we were there, Eric and I went there. It's called the Adler Aphasia Center, and it is in Maywood, New Jersey. And Eric and I went there, and we were amazed. They have a staff there of people who understood what happens when it looks as if you lost your mind and you didn't. It's all there, but it has to be found again. And if you need information, call the Adler Aphasia Center. By now they have other centers in other parts of the world. And when Mike could speak again and swim again and eat the things he loved to eat again, we found out that they did, they're the kind of 
philanthropists who give what they know. And so there is the Adler Aphasia Center. So Mama, Mary Lou Bilgray de Rodriguez says, my mother's family all were immigrants. They came to Panama, but were born in Yugoslavia. My father came from Poland, your uncle also, and I'm living in a country far away from where I was born, meaning Panama, and we are all immigrants. And you are my relative. And I didn't know if Uncle Max would not have rescued, rescued us. We would never have known you. You also wouldn't have survived. Would not have survived. And Mary Lou said it so beautifully. She said, we are your branches. You are. And I am your branch. I'm not a tree trunk. I'm not strong enough. But, and funny about how the art, because when you did your beautiful embroideries, I thought of Panama. I think in some way all of us are connected. We may not know it, but we are. Next week I will speak more about Panama, but I have a very dear friend, ah, here it is, I have a very dear friend whom I met through a crisis center when she was being honored, but I didn't know she was being honored or I wouldn't have had the nerve to speak so much to her. And she just sent me a card from Panama. She's being retired this week with a ceremony of being retired from the military forces. Could you turn it around, Joni, also? Thank you. <laughs> she gave you a tree. Yes. So Donna Graydon is watching. And oh, Donna, please, let me tell you something. I couldn't remember when I wanted to finish your drawing with a mask. And I couldn't because you're working. You're the manager in Panama, in, not Panama, in my Long Beach. But lately you've been in the newspaper a few times. And I was able to figure out the shape around your eyes, which is what I was missing, because I had you in a mask. So, one day, when you have time, I will give you the drawing, okay? And I'll finish it from those photographs. And Paula Lakshan and Laura Silver are saying they love your haircut. And Laura says, congratulations, Tammy, that is a major milestone. Yes. Okay, should we talk about the painting now? Okay, this painting is from a beautiful, beautiful tree. And I called Paul the photographer because I can no longer go there. People, being 91 has such limitations. Primarily, your kids don't let you drive. <laughs> also, the limbs are not good enough to sit for hours as they used to. So I'm doing it from photographs. But I've seen the tree. Now, I need to explain. My friend Janine asked me a, an important question. She said, do you see yourself as a tree? What kind of a tree do you see yourself at? Joni, how much time do we have? You've got 15 minutes. Good, because I'm going to talk a lot. Eileen says the tree is evolving. Yes. Okay. It even has a shadow across it as the day is evolving. Okay. Now be surprised because you have no idea what this will become. Because I don't. Okay. First of all, I can never be a tree, Janine. I went for a walk after you asked me that question. We email to each other. We have a correspondence that's great. And when she asked me that, I went for a walk and I began to think. I looked at trees 
and I thought, they're all rooted to the ground. I'm not. I have no ground to be rooted into. I learned when I was eight years old and we fled Vienna. If I could have picked a spot where I would like to stay forever and root in, it would have been the Vienna before 1938. Because the food was incredible. <laughs> of course, that's the reason. Exactly. I must tell you about why we ended up in Vienna. Because my father came from a very... If you've heard it before, listen. Because it's my background. And I feed it into, I feed into it every day. They were very poor. And hunger was something that he was familiar with in Poland. And one day they had a little store and my father's job when he was a little boy was to go to the neighbors and borrow money to pay the first bit of the rent on that little store. And then the next month or week, however it was done, he went back and paid and then went and borrowed for the next one. But hunger was always present. And one day his father sent him to the salesman who supplied the little store with things. And as he described it, and you'll hear this again, be prepared. My father loved food, and which is why he went to Vienna. And he said the man was eating soup and golden yellow rings of fat were floating in it and enough chicken to feed a whole family on a Friday night. And it was at that moment that he knew he would become a traveling salesman in Vienna so that he could eat like this. And you'll hear the story again, but since I'm going to try to live to 100 and I'm only 91, You'll hear it again. So he took the rent money that he had borrowed and he bought a ticket to Vienna and a few oranges and chocolate bars and a green hat so it would look like an Austrian and they couldn't see his locks called Peus and know that he was Jewish so he would look like an Austrian because of the green hat. And he went to Vienna and he went to an uncle who had a business and he said, I don't want any salary, just give me food and bed and send what my salary would have been to my father because I stole the money from him. When it's paid back, then you can pay me. But until then, just room and board. He became such a good salesman that his uncle never wanted him to leave. But eventually he did. And he loved Vienna so much. He loved the music. He danced. My father loved to dance and he loved to laugh. And those of you who are happy because I have humor, it's because of my father in Vienna. Okay, now let me go back. I have no roots. I lived, I, the funny thing is when I said last time or a few times ago that I belong to three countries, I wrote four. I tried to think it was a Freudian slip and I realized the fourth one is upstate New York, where I met people like you, Shirley, and Charlie Baker, an entirely different world. I'm sure they're all right wing. And I'm a liberal, I'm not left wing. 
I'm not right wing. I'm in between. But the friendships I've formed there, Marion Baker, Joanne Baker, Charlie Baker, Alta Baker, were really a fourth country for me. Which is why when I see people admiring Trump, I can't get upset because I belong to that fourth country also. So I have no roots. If I would be a tree, I would know what to do with this. But I don't. It's going to grow by itself because I could either make, first, I was going to make it be beautiful. I was going to have hills and back and mountains and let it belong to the world. But just a few days ago, the sky got very dark and it had dark clouds and white clouds, which were gray, scattered throughout. And it was glorious. And I thought, maybe this tree has suffered so much. I mean, look how many breakages are going to be there. Maybe it wouldn't feel comfortable in beautiful scenery. Maybe it would say, like me, who, I who don't have roots. Maybe I belong to different weather. And then today my daughter said, Mom, look at the sunset. And there was this beautiful, beautiful, gentle orange clouds. So I have no idea. The tree will shape itself. So on the cloudy day, I look right now, the trees all around me are like lace on top. There are no leaves. Leaves are jumping out of the young trees, but the old trees have very few. So I don't know yet. I don't want the tree to be like me because I don't want to be gnarled and, and withered. Do I hate to tell you, when I look in the mirror, I say to myself, who are you kidding? But it's the price for getting older. Now, we do need to put the light on. Am I right, Joni? I can do that. Yeah. Could you? Thank you. And she cooks well, too. <laughs> nope. That's okay. Next week, they'll see more. I do know this is going to be the shape. I do know if I have leaves, there'll be very few. Okay. So Tammy says she was, they were listening in the car and Hardev Mar Mangat is watching and your son says you are gorgeous. <laughs> it's because I love you and you love me back. You know, the funny thing is love lies a lot. But I love it. I have five minutes to go. I need to speak a little more about Panama. Panama to me was the learning of what the world should be. Because I came from an all-white country where people were born usually in the same rooms that they occupied years later. And I came to a country because of the Panama Canal. People came from all over, like Uncle Max, because you could earn a living building the canal. And what he found out was that when people were thirsty, they needed liquor. And He was a very good businessman. He began in the restaurant business, which didn't mean food, it meant 
liquor. My first knowledge of Americans were people who were dressed all in white and the women wore jewelry and sat on bar stools and drank. And the men sat on bar stools and drank. <coughs> but I also saw the other side and realized the first time on an election day, all bars were closed. And a man I had seen in the bar and restaurant, because we lived upstairs, was lying on the ground, clutching the iron gates, the metal gates of the traffic bar and restaurant, and screaming, let me in, let me in, just one drink, let me in. And when people ask me why I don't drink anything, it's that man. <coughs> so when I go to parties, when I needed to drink, because otherwise people would get upset, I would take the drink and I would sort of sip and go to the nearest plant and throw the drink in. It's amazing how childhood memories shape our lives. <coughs> Marilyn Bilgrave says, uh, Cousin Hetty, I agree you don't have roots, but for me, you are still my tree. I am one of the branches. You are, you are one of the branches, but you're also part of, of my heart in such a way first of all Harry gave us the love that we needed and you may not have known him because you were so little but he gave us the attention that we refugees needed and he had a dog, and the dog was named, I forgot. Uncle Max had a dog named Hyvas. I don't know what Hyvas was, but he made me feel as if I belonged because I would walk him, and people would pat the dog, and then they would speak to me. But I have to go into my memory because my father loved Harry's dog, and used to bathe her, and she loved it. You know, memory is a strange thing. I know her name lies here. So Mary is watching, and Jesse sends you two hearts, and your son calls you a plant killer. I love you all. Thank you for being mine, and please let it be a conversation, okay? I, I need to tell you something I learned from Jesse today. I learned, Jesse works with children. No, I will ask his permission before I can tell it. I'll tell it next week if he allows it, because I'm obeying him. I love you all. Bye-bye.